And welcome to the Jamil Raw Show. And tonight we're going to be going over um, a subject regarding street gangs and millionaires. How in Chicago, millionaires invested money in the projects dealing with street gangs and cleaning up the environment and cleaning up the neighborhood. And this isn't the only time I've seen this happen. I've read other articles about how businessmen, businessmen and different organizations invested money uh, to help street gangs promote clean, safe neighborhoods, that type of thing. <clears throat> now, historically, uh, the, 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 the research I've done that I've presented to the public foremost deals with the Black Panther Party in L.A. and uh, Bunchy Carter and the creation of uh, the Crips coming out of Slauson and talking to the black civil rights leaders of that era and the people who grew up in that era. This coming out of the late 60s. Okay. Now, I've spoken to many people who survived that era, uh, coming out of the 60s, in and out of, involved with street gangs, and coming from my own background, my family, I have a lot of family that lived in Chicago around this era, and some of them grew up in neighborhoods with, of course, street gangs. So, the media often depicts, especially African American black people, as having no potential and zero potential if they are part of a street gang, um, they usually depict street gang members in Chicago especially as being drug dealers or murderers, and that really isn't so much the case as what people expect it to be. <laughs> usually if somebody lives in a neighborhood and there's a gang, uh, usually they're guilty by association. They may not have been formally um, initiated into the gang, but just because they go to school with these same guys or they walk home with these same guys, Oftentimes, police may put them in a gang file, or, you know, the, the rivals of that neighborhood might just single them out just because they live in the neighborhood, so naturally, they, they embrace the gang just for a safety purpose. Most people have a deep miscomprehension about what happens to individuals who grow up in neighborhoods like this. <laughs> so, we're going to look at a positive story um, dealing with street gangs in the 1970s, and for the most part... This street gang, the conservative vice lords, to me, especially in that era in the 70s, was more of a fraternal organization. Uh, these guys used the same symbols as any other fraternal organization. The top hat, the cane. Uh, you know, you can just, you can go look at their literature. And they were an actual, you know, they had a business that you could go to called Conservative Vice Lords Incorporated. Um... But they were an actual fraternal order, with no mistakes made. Now, what they became after that, popularly, is something quite different. But at that time, you know, it was very interesting. So, I'm going to start the reading. Uh, when Millionaires Funded Gangs. Untitled, undated article reprinted by the courtesy of the Chicago Historical Society. The article was probably written in the early 1970s. Okay. When three millionaires decided to channel money into street gangs living in Chicago, ghettos they found, it couldn't, okay, when three millionaires decided to channel money into street gangs living in Chicago ghettos, they found it couldn't be done quietly. For one thing, money makes the kind of noise that always seems to attract politicians for good or ill. For another... Some spent to cure a civic ailment like the gangs are much like the radioactive iodine used to trace a cancer in a dying patient. The experts all follow it very closely. So, okay. And so, predictably, the millionaires came under the politicians' fire. The city council last week called them or their spokesman in for a hearing and demanded to know by what right they provided money to an element of a populace everybody else had given up on. Eld Claude Holman, co-chairman of the city council subcommittee that conducted the hearing, went so far as to propose a law to prevent the benefactions. One W. Clement Stone was a target of the council's Democratic majority because he is a benefactor of the Republican Party. The millionaires, besides Stone, are Charles E. Merrill Jr. and C.F. Kettering. They exhibited three different styles 
and their charity. Here are their stories. So you see it's already getting interesting. You have millionaires who are going to the heart of the black community in Chicago during a, 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 a really rough era, you know, 70s, and saying, we have millions of dollars, we're going to invest. And already politicians are hitting them like, why are you doing this? Why are you going to help these people? Blah, 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 blah. So you see already, that's, that's just a quick view into how hard it is for black people living and, and the struggle, so to speak, to, to come out of it. I mean, anybody who tries to give them, you know, if somebody comes along who wants to give them a chance, they get beat down just for trying. For Chicago, insurance executive Clement Stone, money to the conservative vice lord is not a dole, but a phase of reclamation project, which began with several of the lord's hierarchy landed in Illinois prisons and came into contact with Stone's self-help program offered there. We felt there was a great energy in these young men, said Stone, and that all we needed to do was channel it and show them we were willing to take a chance on them. Stone's philanthropic, our W. Clement Stone Foundation, cut the chance taking it to a minimum. Any money the vice lords received was to be a loan for their west side businesses and proceeds were to be used to pay bills already incurred as as well as offering a well-managed stake for the future. I want to stop right there. This reminds me of the historical connection between the Black Panther Party and the uh, Los Angeles Brown Berets. The Brown Berets were the equivalent to the Black Panthers. They were just Hispanic or Brown Berets. And these two gr groups somehow banded together in the 60s and 70s. And this article somehow reminds me of that, and they had investors who invested into them at the time. Okay, moving on. I'm not interested in running any bail bond fund, <laughs> said Stone. I think the vice lords have become a force for good on the west side. To the extent our loan can help them develop projects like the African Lion Clothing Store, Art and Soul Neighborhood Craft Center, Teen Town, and others, we are doing a service. Nothing is being given away because that doesn't really help. The vice lords became the conservative vice lords and founded their corporation in 1967, just in time to see the West Side burn down and the rioting that followed the death of Martin Luther King. Well, that's powerful right there. So, I want to take a little break now. In the 1960s, Chicago was still the second largest city in the country. A lot of people think of New York City being the largest city, and of course it still is. Then they think of Los Angeles being the second largest city. That's, you know, in the 1960s, it was New York, then Chicago. And Martin Luther King spent a lot of time talking to street gangs in Chicago. Uh, so Martin Luther King knew a lot of these gang members. And it's kind of, it, it's kind of, it, you know, it, it, it's sort of funny in the sense that Martin Luther King was probably in jail more than them. Because, because <laughs> you know, for the, for the bus boycotts, Martin Luther King probably spent more time in jail than a lot of these gang members. But anyway, when the Vice Lords President Jamie Brown and the rest of the Vice Lords got tired of running around the streets, a 3,700 block of 16th Street on the west side began to fill their makeshift business enterprises. There were many bills, but few profits, in an area where money leaves every night with the non-resident owners of property. When most of them were burned out, the money flow ebbed even further. The loan-making process to the Lords came slow. They applied and waited, submitted budgets, and resubmitted them. They got the YMCA to act as fiscal agent through Operation Bootstrap, executive committee which includes, among others, officers of the Chicago Board of Education and Chicago Police Department. So you see how high up this has gotten. You got actual street gang members uh, being, being inheriting millions of dollars to clean their community, and now they're working with police officers. This is a pretty, that's a pretty big thing. That's a pretty big accomplishment. A $60,000 loan was approved last April. It provides for a sliding scale of interest from 3 to 6% over a five-year period with no payments during the first year. This will help them move themselves if they can, says Stone. I know what a first, I know what a first break can do and what charity cannot. And now the Vice Lords... 
the Vice Lords gang is is a large gang. This gang at this point in time in history that we're in right now, there's gang, Vice Lord members all over the world. So, the, I mean, the Vice Lords are not a force to be reckoned with. You know, I, I to this day I have family members who live in Chicago in that area, and so these, I mean, these people are some of the same guys who are working to clean up the community. I'm sure some of these same guys are still around. Now we're going to be moving. Charles Merrill Jr. is the son of the founder of the nation's largest brokerage firm. And that's at a time, see, the <clears throat> when you look at street gangs in Chicago, you have the People's Nation, then the Folk Nation. This is before that. Back when, back in the 60s, this is a little bit predating that, that dynamic. Chicago gangs were a lot different at that time in the 60s. Charles Merrill Jr. is the son of the founder of the nation's largest brokerage firm, Merrill Lynch, and headmaster of the Commonwealth School, which he founded in Boston. One of Merrill's pupils at Commonwealth, Margot Gray, came out of Chicago's South Side Ghetto, and together with Saul Alinsky and Reverend John Fry, the first of Presbyterian Church, convinced Merrill he could get help, he, he could help tame Chicago's Ranger Nation. Ranger. I don't know what he means by Ranger Nation. You had it, there was a his gang in Chicago many years ago called the Black Rangers. I'm not sure if he's referencing that. I'm really two people, said Merrill, and as such, And as such, I must deal with two kinds of money. There is the rather conservative Merrill Trust with iChair, and there is my own personal money, which I risk where I see fit. I recommended that the funds supply 20000 to the Chicago Church for the specific purpose of obtaining a teacher for their neglected children's program. I hope they could reclaim 6.7 and 8-year-old children and eight-year-old children given up as unfit by the Chicago school system. This was fully in keeping with other projects. The fund was unwritten, and the rest of the directors approved my recommendation. I'm going to pause for a minute. I'll make a comment now. This reminds me of the Five Points gang coming out of New York, which it was a very old gang. And, you know, there's a movie based off it called Gangs in New York, right? But the New York Fire Department, Today's New York Fire Department actually came out of the gangs in New York. It was the gangs of New York um, working with Tammany Hall that created New York's fire departments. If it had not been for the street gangs in New York, you wouldn't have had a New York fire department. So, you know, a lot of these gangs, uh, a lot of the Irish and, and uh, you know, other groups, maybe Italians or or any type of immigrant who came over in the early 1900s that were living on the streets, they lived the same type of lifestyle that anybody in the African American ghetto was living in Chicago at this time. So you can look, you know, you can look back to the early 1900s and see immigrant crime, same kind of way. And so these gangs in Chicago at this time aren't doing anything different than the immigrants in the late 18, early 1900s weren't doing on the East Coast. The project is not dead. At at Merrill, we knew our money was for a teacher only, and that it would not be spent until the four hundred fifty thousand for their community education center could be raised. If there was more concern for helping these projects than there is for pointing finger at the stones, the money might have been used by now. Merrill began to spend his own money on projects on the south side in nineteen sixty two he said in October and November, I sent two checks for a thousand to the Black Power Starting Now organization, which Miss Gray administered. The money was for music and recreation innovation. Oh my God! And at that time, in 1962, a thousand dollars was a lot of money. In 1962, a thousand dollars was at least ten thousand dollars, you know, easily, easily at least ten thousand dollars. Maybe probably more, probably like fifteen thousand or something like that. In 1962, you know. By September of 1969, I had sent 3,000 to the neglected children's program 
and 5500 to start the newspapers for those in the Rangers with an interest in writing the papers were third rate and I believe they folded but there was a chance to reach some people through a medium that was their own and I took the chance. Merrill continued to support gang activity with 3,000 checks in January of 1970 to outfit the Black Power starting now offices and uh, 10,500 in July of this year to help fund stone activities like barbershop, children's game center, community police patrol, and drum and bu bugly corps. I really can't say whether or not any of the projects are still active, said Merrill. I suspect that none of them are, but I have also been told about the kind of harassment the Chicago police have been involved in. Uh, so, there's a di sound, sounds like there's a dichotomy there. These guys have been putting all kinds of money into these programs, and people have gotten things moving. There may be some harassment coming from the police to halt the progress of these people in the community. Uh, that should not be surprising, looking back to the Civil Rights Movement. Um, I suppose I should have kept a closer watch on the money, said Merrill, but I really am a headmaster first, so I must trust other people to an extent. Kettering, grandson of the General Motors Reach chief who developed the self-starter, also found that remote-controlled ghetto projects <laughs> administered from his Inglewood Colo home don't always stay in <laughs> Mole control, mole control, get, get old pride. I never heard of it. The Kettering Foundation, of which I am a member, like everyone else, gave the first Presbyterian Church 50,000 of the 60,000 or so it requested in 1967, said Kettering. The money was to go for projects in basic education in the area, as well as work education projects and business enterprise training, which are desperate needs out there. Kettering blamed the government investigations of e OEO projects at the First Presbyterian Church, the creating undue controversy in 1968 when Eugene Harrison of the Stone was jailed shortly thereafter for, solici for solicitation to commit murder. Kettering said the original work was all but lost. You know, that's the sad part is usually when people who live in a rough situation like that try to do better for themselves, people always try to attack them. Uh, the, the establishment, whether it be the police or the people in the area, they just don't want to see somebody do better for themselves. They don't want they don't want to see somebody make something out of themselves. It's easier to watch these guys do drugs. It's easier to watch these guys steal. It's easier to watch these guys kill these guys kill themselves. It's easier to watch these guys land in jail. For some reason, there's people out there who find it difficult to see another man make progress. You know, and that's sad. But still goes on today. Gene Harrison was a force for good out there, no matter what anybody tells you, said Kettering. With Gene off the street and a controversy around Reverend Fry and the church, things began to grind to a halt. <clears throat> By the fall of 1963, a legal defense fund had been formed. We thought that if we would overcome the harassment the police could create with Trump, we thought if we could overcome the harassment the police could create with Trump to arrest, we could create some feeling of hope around the project, said Kettering. So I arranged with my bank to supply the legal defense need. Defense needs would arise as long as we could. Wow, so the conservative vice lords were, were like Master P said about it. <laughs> the conservative vice lords were, were, were in the civil, were deep in the civil rights struggle at that time. They were a street gang, but they, they were messing with millions of dollars and then the political battle and getting covert harassment and all kinds of crazy ass, excuse my language, stuff. Kettering said later that he couldn't really say how much money was funded through the Chicago Legal Defense Fund out of his account, but that but that the published figure, 260000 wouldn't surprise me. Although I can't say exactly how much of that was mine, did the plan work? We were quite discouraged to find that Although the number of acquittals were increased, the number of cases stayed pretty much the same, said Kettering. For right now, you could say that while I, intended, I intend to keep my commitments I made about cases already opened, I will phrase out my involvement in new cases. We may have incurred some failures along the way, said Kettering, and those will prove 
expensive, but we are learning all the time about kids, not just about nags. And I, for one, will keep right on. Oh, that's see, I like to see stuff like that. People trying to make something better out of a bad situation. Education is usually the first step along the way. Um, and that was back in the, you see, the 60s and 70s. Now, a lot of this thinking, I think, in the black community especially, came from the Willie Lynch Doctrine, which was created on the slave plantations uh, to keep people divided and opposed to each other. And you see this today. You see this For some reason, this is, this is one thing, and I don't have any racial discrimination against any type of race. You know, I mix myself. But well, this is the type of thing. It seems like I've always seen this with living in the living, going through, you know, for a period of time I lived in the black community and I still have family and I still go there. And I've always noticed this that when when black people aren't too self conscious, usually when a white person comes around, they usually look to the white person to, to have all, like they usually give the white person the responsibility of making choices for them or they look to the white person as having more say. And that's usually when people are less educated, less aware, and less conscious. I notice when people are more educated and aware, they take more responsibility for themselves and they no longer look to another individual to, for, for an answer, to make a choice for them. How oh, the interesting reading. The conservative vice lords. I wouldn't mind speaking with one of these gentlemen that were, that were a part of this clean, clean up. Clean up the neighborhood, Lawndale in the 1960s. That's amazing. I love contacting older uh, older gang members, like the like the like the Crips and, and, and the Bloods, all that stuff, and any type of Hispanic gang or Chicago gang. I like talking to these people that grew up in the '60s and '70s and seeing what where you know what was going on and how they felt about it and where they came from. If you treat anybody with respect, you can get pretty far in the world. It's all about respect. Then the gangster disciples did some of the same not to the gangster disciples did may have some of the same accomplishments. What's the name of that gang in, in uh, New York? What's the the angels? The guardian angels. The guardian angels. The guardian angels. The guardian angels are a gang in New York that used to help stop muggings. This is funny. This, this is a street gang from New York City going back to like the 50s, 60s or whatever. And they called themselves the Guardian Angels and they ran around with handcuffs and stuff. And they rode on the subways. And their goal was to reduce crime. Just them, just them being there reduced crime. Just them being on the subway meant there was going to be, you know, people felt safer and there was going to be less of a hassle. The Guardian. I remember my grandfather first told me about the Guardian Angels. He said he, he was in New York and he met some of them. On the, he was walking down the street and he seen some of them and talked to them for a second. I wonder, it looks like they're still around. This kind of reminds me of the Detroit Urban Guardian. In Detroit, right now in Detroit there's Right. 
right now there's Urban Garden going on in Detroit. And so, you know, for the first time in I think like 80 years, a, wood, a woodpecker or a beaver, a beaver showed up in Detroit. And I thought that was amazing. And there's like coyotes coming back in Detroit and there's a, there's wild dogs that get together and run around together. There's like packs of wild dogs that live freely in Detroit. And it's gonna, you know, look, it's it's pretty, it's pretty desolate, and people are coming in. And you could you could buy a house for a dollar almost right about now. Uh, you could a couple years ago you could buy a house for a dollar in Detroit, and people are making urban gardens. Yeah. Some of these people are st some of the people that worked on that project. I bet you're still living in the neighborhood. You can learn a lot just by, if you relax and just read the graffiti. I like looking at the graffiti, let me say graffiti, Chicago gang graffiti from the 1970s. Oh man, yeah. That's back when they used to have business cards. The royals, the insane popes, the bishops. That's back when somebody would come up to you and just give you a business card. Business cards are worth money now. And this is the Jamil Rawls Show.